Well, hey. How are you? Seriously, how are you doing? Um, thank you so much. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to call you Ellen, but I do feel like I know you, Ellen. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. Thank you so much, CJ, for welcoming me to this place. And thank you all for coming out. I mean, inside myself as a little girl uh, who's, I don't know, six and has memorized some lines for the Christmas play. And so that little girl is like, do I know my lines? Do I know my lines? Um, but she's also always thrilled that people will just come and have a conversation. That's kind of amazing to think that people will come and talk and listen. So I appreciate that. Um, I am Jackie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm deeply uh, moved by this institution's insisting on creating a container in which young people learn to be global citizens who understand that they are actors in a drama. And the drama is the healing of the world. Uh, I'm thrilled to know that you've put this front and center because that's what university is about. That's what college is about. Like a transformational box. How many of you are my age and remember new math? where the figure walked toward the box and the multiplication or divide or whatever was on there. So, so university is a transformational box where the, the young one, the just past puberty ones really come to a place where they can be shaped and molded and they can stretch and they can contract and they can wrestle with new ideas and ideally have their souls expanded and their hearts cracked wide open with empathy and understanding of the, of the way the other sees the world and therefore participate in making the world a beautiful place. So congratulations to you in this institution for the sparkly, wonderful young people that I've already encountered here. And aren't we blessed that they're here? So when we're really super old, They'll have, made a, they'll have made a more just society. What do you think? Yes. So we're not in church, <clears throat> but we're in church, right? <laughs> and I just would love to invite you, because we're all in this place together, bringing our different spiritual traditions or, um, or even our you know, ethical commitments that are not grounded in spiritual traditions. But let's just take a breath together and imagine that the breath is animating our curiosity and our wonder and our yearning for more. Just take a breath in. Now COVID is still alive, so we don't want to breathe too hard on our friends, but <laughs> take one more. And I want to ground us in an anthem that comes from the movies as a starting place. It's a really beautiful piece from The Greatest Show, The Greatest Showman, and it's This Is Me. Because our talk today has as a thesis that the healing of this world starts with you, starts with me starts with us. And so I'm going to argue that if we're going to do this world healing soul work, we've got to listen to the deep meaning in almost all the world's greatest religions, which say you love your neighbor as yourself. Judaism, you shall love the stranger, I think 57 times in the Hebrew scriptures, and one time you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, the Christian scriptures, um, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But also Rabbi Jesus, quoting Leviticus and Deuteronomy, says, love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I understand from my colleagues in Islam that the Quran says, 
Don't withhold anything from anyone that you need for yourself. Isn't that beautiful? Don't withhold anything from anyone that you need for yourself. One of the highest bars comes from our sick family. Our sick family says, don't do anything to break anyone else's heart. Can you imagine a world guided by an ethic? Don't do anything to break anyone's heart. This love of neighbor and love of self, I think, is solution. It's problem solving. It's how we're going to get there. And you got to love you, baby, to get there. So let's take a look at this anthem. And you know, it's light in here. Is there any way to make it just a teeny darker? Without it being scary? <laughs> this is our gospel choir singing, This Is Me. And the little girl who starts singing is a person I baptized. And her parents have been teaching her how to love herself. Listen.
Not that God willed the fire. I don't think that's true. But in that space where we might think even the worst of things have something to teach us, the fire taught us something about um, what really matters, uh, which is each other. Um, we found out that we're resilient in the fire. We found out that we can resist um, being too angry at the cause of the fire. We found out that we had love that the fire couldn't destroy. Um, and when I wrote Fierce Love, the book was due to the publisher in December, and the fire happened on December 5th. So we pushed the date back, uh, this book that I wrote. And so the fire starts in the book a little bit. Uh, and what the fire gave me as a gift was clarity about what I believed in. And so that's what I'm talking about. I believe in all kinds of stuff, like science and the earth is in trouble, and I believe in God. I do. I'm a professional God believer. I believe it, that my husband loves me no matter what. I believe that. <laughs> I believe my friends uh, are ride or die. And I believe in love. I believe that love is the most potent, powerful, transformative force on the planet. And I believe this because I have uh, eyewitness testimony that the fire happened. And in Beijing, China, they showed the fire on the news. Who knows why? But from China to Australia to New Zealand to Perry Street in Manhattan, people wrote us love notes because the fire took away our home. And they maybe saw us somewhere march in the parade or do a protest or whatever. But they sent love notes from all over the globe. And that love sustained us. I also found out that people could go to church online. <sighs> COVID had showed us some of that, but the fire made it sort of impossible to, impossible to go to church. And 670 people joined our church in three years. Um, because they could go to church online. The fire showed us that community doesn't have to be in person. It can be in Zoom squares. But the most important lesson I got from the fire is how much my people love each other. And I studied them. So I want to talk about what I've learned about this kind of fierce love, this kind of fierce love. This so let me take us, let me do a little bit of a political high-level analysis kind of a paragraph or two, um, and then come down into a, another space. When I say that all the world's major religions have something about love, love, neighbor, love, self in it, um, it's true. But it's also true that I don't think the major religions teach us how to love ourselves. That got some hooms, right? Like, what was the class you took? seminary, preachers. What was the philosophy class you took on loving yourself? PhD, erudites. Um, what's, what's, the, what's the catechism you got, Catholic students, about like love yourself? Like, and the first part's love yourself, right? I mean, where did we, what? Nobody talks about it. It does not get discussed, especially in spiritual places, lots of nods, because we're taught that the love of self is selfish, or narcissistic, or aggrandized, or arrogant, or fluffy, or who do you think you are-ness. So many negative words associated with love of self, when in fact, I have to say, as an expert in my text, love neighbor and love self is connected in the Greek by the word os, which is an equal sign. So that the writers of those texts weren't saying, oh, by the way, love yourself. The writers of those texts were saying, you have to love yourself in order to love your neighbor. And on some level, that resonates with us, right? We're like, yeah, that makes sense to love myself so I can love my neighbor. But like, how do I love myself? What does it look like to love yourself? And how do you learn to love yourself in an environment that is at least caustic and at best filled with violence and rage and prejudice, right? And anger. 
we live in hot mess times. Hot mess times. My mother would be angry to hear me say that, so bless her heart. She's passed away six years ago, so she doesn't know how often I say the words hot and mess in a sentence. But these are the hottest mess times of the hot mess times that I've lived in. I'm not a teenager, right? I was born in 1959, right? lived in the context of, um, you know, of, of racial terror in the southern states, right? I lived in the context. I grew up in a context of segregation. I grew up in a context of the civil rights movement moving against racial hatred and bias. Four little girls bombed in a church. I grew up in the Martin Luther King does the march and the retribution is violence. I grew up where, where people were burning bras and standing against the Vietnam War and I was like, I'm too young. Why am I not out there burning a bra when I don't need one? Anyway, I, I grew up in the context of the foment and struggle and wrestling of which story was gonna be the story of our nation. Yea, which story was gonna be the story of our world, right? This, this is tumult, this is um, weeping and gnashing, this is, this is century, centuries of who are we gonna be. I am black, as you can see. My parents are black, not true for everybody, could be adopted, I am from black people who grew up in Mississippi, Ruleville, where Fannie Lou Hamer um, worked on voting rights, and my Uncle George worked with her, and my mother picked cotton in the fields with her, I have since learned. My father grew up in Meridian, where the three young men were killed uh, trying to register people to vote. My parents grew up not, I'm coming down, tell me if the mic's not gonna work. My parents grew up crossing the street so as not to meet the eyes of white people and have them think they were sassy. Do you understand what I'm talking about? My parents walked past the high school to go to the colored high school where their books were old. My mother picked cotton from when she was four years old. My father chopped trees. I grew up with parents who grew up in American apartheid. I grew up with parents who migrated from Mississippi to Omaha, damn Nebraska, excuse my language, what is, where is Omaha? Well, that's where I was born, you know, because they were in the Air Force doing the things in the Air Force, and there we are. But I, they, they, they left that tough situation to go to the Air Force base where basically equality is kind of legislated. Right? I grew up with parents who who were raised by single mothers, but whose mothers taught them that they were special and significant and that their lives mattered and they could do good things and they just had to work hard and they just had to learn and they just had to pray and they would be good citizens in the United States. So that's what my parents did, right? My dad joined the Air Force. Um, I'm five years old, I'm living in New Hampshire on the Air Force base and Lisa, little girl from Mississippi, moves in to the neighborhood and calls me the N-word in the, in the kindergarten circle, right? After we churned the butter, <laughs> she called me the N-word. I grew up with parents who then went to the Air Force Base commander and said, oh, no, no, no. She will be apologizing to my daughter, and her father will be apologizing to my father. And my father was an activist and like demanding Black Lives Matter before there was a phrase, right? And my mother took me to prayer. Like, girl, when people act like that, we pray. I grew up in a family that felt that they had power over their circumstances. But it was a hot mess, right? Because the wages were lower, right? Because the health care is lower, because the mortality rates are higher, because the incarceration rates are higher. Are you with me? Be because their stories as black people in America weren't just about their moms and grand uncles who loved them, it was about a nation that did not value their lives. Today, today, we haven't overcome. We just haven't overcome. 
I'd like to think we have because I'm an optimistic, sunny, sunshine human, but black women still die of childbirth in 2023 at rates that are outrageous. Diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, poverty, uh, incarceration rates. Didn't I make that list before? All of those lists from 1963 are the same lo mismo as they were 40 years ago, that it's still 13 times more money that the average white family makes than the average black family of four. Can I say it slower? 13 times more the average white family makes than the average black family makes. And guess what? That average white family could have a high school educated head of family. And that is still true versus the black family with a college education. We just haven't overcome. Can I get you to come with me till we haven't overcome? Um, I'm, I'm just wanting to set a table for the container in which we all live. So my little brothers, who are not little anymore, 60 and however old they are, three of them, grow up as African-American men in a context where, seriously, in Chicago, they are terrified of whether they'll be carjacked or shot at a gas station. Lawyer, an army general, a teacher. My Grammy award-winning sister makes less money than her male counterparts in the business she owns. Um, that's our story. Let's talk about Latinx families. Let's talk about indigenous families. Let's talk about poverty that's in all of our ethnic scenarios and the grip it has on our lives. Let's talk about the Ap Appalachian grandmother who has to choose between paying her bills and buying her medicine. Do you see that? It's not just about black and white. It's a colorful story of a nation in which we haven't fixed our social problems. We haven't solved the way the founding father's dream of democracy hasn't come to fore. And in fact, the founder's dream of democracy was built on three-fifths of a person. Black people. And it was built on indigenous people are cute. This is Thomas Jefferson's notes on Virginia. I like to paraphrase them. In indigenous people are good looking, but they're not as smart as we are. That's what Thomas Jefferson wrote to, to, to France about Virginia. And black people, they're neither good looking nor smart, and I have a suspicion that they are inferior. Thomas founding father Jefferson exported that doctrine of American apartheid to Europe, which led to pseudo race science which led to Caucasoid mountains and skulls of gypsies being found. And some weird mad scientist thinks that those skulls are good looking, so let's call that Caucasian. Don't call people Caucasian anymore if you don't have to. Just call them white, because Caucasian is a, is a word that is conjured up to codify racial st stratification. Do you hear me? You with me? Right? So Jefferson, founding father, ah, writes a letter to France to invite France to come play in America and starts in motion a European understanding of what blackness is not. We're still living with that. Young people in my classroom today understand what I mean, and you do too. We didn't do it, but it's here. We didn't do it and it affects all of us. It affects every single one of us. Every single person in the room, all the people in our neighborhoods, all the people are affected by the way America works, the way the systems work around education, around healthcare, around religion. This is a Christian hegemony, I say as a Christian. It's, a, it's an anti-Semitic, anti-Islamic, xenophobic, anti-women, anti-black, anti-everything. 
sexual minorities, anti-queer, power structure that does not encourage our flourishing. Whew. Should we just take a breath on that? Is that fun? <laughs> Is that joy causing? No. Do we flourish in that? No. It leads to competition. It leads to a feeling of scarce resources. It leads to, I can't be your people and you can't be my people unless we think exactly alike and all share the same. We've become tribal. We pull away from each other. We don't make a community that looks like this out there because we're just so pressured to stick with our own kind and to fight with each other to see who's the most oppressed, to see who's the most put down. Not, not community, not collaboration, but competition, right? Say competition in, in your mouth, right? Like that, that, that's what it is. It isn't, wonder if we could scratch each other's back. It isn't, wonder if we could organize our communities so we could like all make a better playground for our kids. Wonder if we could have interfaith coalitions that stand against the drugs on that corner. Wonder if we could invite each other into the play space, the creativity to do something about the environment without all the yucky, nasty, mean, curled insults in social media, on the media. Oh my goodness, doesn't it just make you want to cry some days? It makes me want to cry some days. And what I want to say is, it's in that container, that environment, that we have become a people. I'm a little girl in that environment. You were a little girl in that environment. You are a little girl in that environment. Your little person grew up in this environment, in this context, where somebody told you, you can't play with that boy. You, you grew up in this environment where someone told you the only way to heaven is through this gate <laughs> and all the other people can't go, right? You grew up in the environment where maybe you were white and you couldn't afford college and your parents were like, what the? That's our birthright. And they put inside you resentment and anger because you felt replaced. You didn't do that, but you got that. You, you feel me? You, you didn't get told you could speak up as a woman. You didn't get told that as, a, that as a person who, I promise you, I don't know a gay person that walked in the world and went, you know what, I think it'd be really fun to choose to be gay. I, let me think, what would happen if I chose that? Oh, I know, I might get discriminated against. That'd be great. That'd be fun, right? That'd be so just enjoyable to have people be angry with me for my sexuality. I'm saying we inherit a culture that hasn't been kind to us as a human family, so that we could be the very best human beings that we were designed to be. The environment crushes our spirit, makes us anxious, thirsty. <laughs> look at me, look at me like you're not mad. Don't be mad. Am I making sense? Yes. She's, she's supposed to be the fun. I'm getting there. She's the fun speaker. Listen, this is the truth that sets us free. Does any of us, do any of us want our children on the playground thinking the other children on the playground are less than them? Does any of us want, any of us want our, our, our children to think that they have to step on somebody to get someplace? Does anybody want that? Do any of us want fear to be the discourse of our nation? No. Does anybody, does really anybody want any human being to be hungry? Do they deserve that? Do, do any of us want that? People on the streets, because the economy doesn't work? No. My friend Achebe was 82 years old, a professor, a teacher, an activist, a famous activist who joined our church. Who knew she was famous? She died at 82 of COVID. She died of 80, at 82 of COVID a month ago because she's black and diabetic and a little overweight. And you know, like, didn't have the, 
didn't have the stuff, right? Did, didn't grow up in the family that had the stuff for good health care, like just didn't, just inherited as a pre-existing condition, poverty, and not the best health. And she's dead. The environment does not cause us as many opportunities as I would like to flourish and thrive in love together. The environment is doing what it do. The system is doing what it was designed to do. It is pitting us against each other. It is causing us to compete. It creates the context of scarcity. It makes us think that we are not each other's people, but we are actually each other's people. And the only way we're going to make this world good enough for my grandbabies, Octavius and Olivia, three and five, very cute, the only way we're going to make this, this neighborhood that's called the good enough for your grandbabies and for your new partner and for the farm you want to have and for the, you know, for the scientific discovery that's just waiting to be had by my little, is this Brooks? Is that right? Do I have it right? By little book. She got stuff to do. Don't we want, don't we want this environment to be good enough for you? Yes, yes, of course we do, right? How are we gonna do it? We're gonna have to just tell the truth about how hard it actually is to learn to love yourself in the context of this place and make the place better so we can actually love ourselves. Do you see the circle I'm making? Because then if we can love ourselves, then we can love our neighbors. And if we can love our neighbors, we can love ourselves. And the only way we make that circle happen is we've got to tell the truth about what's broken so we can fix it. And that is called speaking the truth in love and then loving each other to solutions to how absolutely hard it is in this environment to do and be loved. That's the truth. And that truth will liberate us if we let it. It focuses our energy, can make us have powerful conversations at the table. You can invite girls with purple suits on to come talk about it. It's just amazing what can happen. But we, we are, I think, charged, each one of us charged, to say, I know what I can do I can do about this. And the this we don't deny, we don't pretend, we don't close our eyes. This, this right here, we maybe didn't start it. We didn't start the fire. But we can put the fire out. We can put it out. And the starting place, I think, is to admit that this is hard work. And then to roll up our sleeves and jump in there. So I'm not really usually a mantra sayer type of human being, that's not me. But let's say one. Let's just say together, this is hard work. Like, like a little more like, you, like, wow, like this is hard work. Give me some energy with it. This is hard work. This is our work. Come on. <laughs> I, no, I think you need that one more time. This is our work. This is my work. This is my work. And you don't have to repeat this, but this is what you mean when you say it in the mirror. Because I'm on the planet. And I'm human, and I need other humans on the planet to survive and thrive. Therefore, their survival and thrival is my business. They, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, I am. I am my sister's keeper. I am my sibling's keeper. I need you to survive, and you need me right back. This is hard work. 
Don't go shy me now. This is hard work. This is our work. This is my work. This is my work. Our lives depend on it. Our lives depend on it. Our lives depend on it. Yeah. So what are we going to do next? What are we going to do? Mm. I want I want to tell you a story. First of all, I don't know what kind of drugs I was taking when I wrote this book and told all of my business in it. And how crazy do they think I am? Um, I want to tell you a story about my mom dying. She had lung cancer. She wrestled with it for eight years. The day I called her, like we just, you know, you just call your mama, like drive by love. I called her this one May day for my drive by love. I just told her, mom, what's up, mom? Oh, precious, she says, I have cancer, right? And she had stage four small cell, you're gonna die from it, lung cancer, that had already metastasized. And she fought for eight years, chemo, cyber knife, all kinds of radiation, all kinds of stuff, and fought like a champ, like waited, like yeah, she's like, I'm not going anywhere, Wanda's not married yet, I'm waiting for Wanda's marriage, I'm waiting for Rio's fifth birthday, I'm waiting for Rodney to get his JD, I'm waiting for my, uh, my 50th wedding anniversary. She waited for her 50th wedding anniversary and for her 80th birthday, and she died two weeks after that. Now, my mother was almost a saint, but not really fully, but almost a saint. Like, if you look up saints, her picture was there. She's, pretty good. She's a pretty good lady. Smart, thoughtful, kind, funny, humble, funny, funny, humble, truth-telling. Don't sass her. That was, the, that was the thing that would break the truce. But um, she was my first preacher, my first teacher, my times table teacher, my history facts memorizer, my Bible verse learner. She was the and Daddy was there. They were they stayed married. Sometimes we wished they had broken up, but they stayed married and <laughs> they had a really beautiful friendship. And so he was her partner, but she was my people. So she's dying, right? And between us, all the good things between mom and I, but between us was one thing that was not so good, which was that I had had an experience of childhood um, molestation um, by a person that we knew, and she didn't know, right? So she didn't know. So as a girl child, she didn't know was just like a thing I could never process. Like, you didn't know? Right? I'm seven. You don't know, right? But she didn't know. But I couldn't do, she didn't know. I just really couldn't do a non-conversation between us. Do you know what I mean? Like, we are going to do that. We're going to have turkey and dressing, but we're not going to talk about that. It was just a big void between us because we, we couldn't get to it until she was about to die. When she was about to die, I would spend time in the hospital room with her, and we just talked about all the things. One night, I woke up, I fell asleep on, on the couch, and I woke up to her staring at me. What are you doing? I'm memorizing your face. Why? Because you're beautiful. You're beautiful, too. Like, all the love making we did, yeah, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But also, finally, I really feel so badly that I didn't know, Jack. I just didn't know. She said, I never heard of that. So how could I know that? And I don't know what happened. It cracked me open for the first time that she just really didn't know. And with that feeling of the truth of it was this like rush of love, like a rush of love, like a gushing of love, like, oh wow, you didn't, you really didn't know. And I realized that as much as I needed her to know, so I could feel something, whatever that would have been, anger, disappointment, whatever I needed her to know, 
She needed me to forgive her for not knowing. And I felt plugged into her, like it was still an umbilical cord. And that in that umbilical cord, she was giving me the last parts I needed to grow up. So I was giving her the forgiveness that she needed to die. I think she was waiting for that. And she was giving me the stuff Live. Like, I live differently. Though I miss her, I live better because she gave me some stuff, right? In the end, it wasn't your fault. I didn't know, but it wasn't your fault. You weren't too shiny. You weren't too sparkly. You weren't too something that made the person abuse you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand, but I know y'all know. There's enough people in the room that somebody knows exactly what I'm talking about. That it's your fault in your brain, no matter what, you did something, well, did you smile too hard? Was your skirt too short? Did you what did you do? She's like, no, 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 no. That was not your fault. And I got another blood transfusion or love transfusion to live because my mother gave it to me. What's that got to do with this loving ourself thing? Somebody in our life needs that from us so they can love themselves. Somebody needs it. Somebody needs you to forgive them their trespasses. Somebody needs you to let them know that you are over it. Somebody needs you to tell them it's not your fault. Somebody needs you to give them life in an umbilical cord of love so they can love themselves so the neighborhood can get better. Somebody needs something you have that will set them free rather than keeping them trapped in the box of like swirling and swirling and swirling and what can we do and how did we do it and why do, how did we get here? Somebody needs you to liberate them so they can be free enough to liberate the next person. Do you understand what I'm talking about? A chain of imprisonment that we put each other in because of all the junk. It's in the world, it's in our lives. Of course, we could feel trapped in it forever. Or we could be chain breakers. We could be liberators. We could be way makers. We could be problem solvers. We could see each other as the light we are and give each other permission to be light and love. We could do that. We could give each other permission to change our stories, to get our stories straight. And this, I think, when I say it starts with you, I mean you have that power to bless somebody that way, right? To see your child tormented by the space between what you think they should be and who they want to be. And because you do your work and you say, what? This is hard, but this is my work. You can let your child be who they are as opposed to who you need them to be. You could, because you have the power, we have the power. You could let your colleague at work tell you the parts of you that you need to change to make it better. I had my staff at a retreat yesterday, Lord, my foray. Tell me what's really happening right here. Well, you know, sometimes, you know, whatever. Let, let's get it said. Sometimes we're afraid that you might react to an idea with your forceful enthusiasm, they called it. Okay. <laughs> I, I know what they mean. <laughs> I'm an enthusiast on the Enneagram. But if I want a team that is strong enough to heal the world, I have to let myself be the subject sometimes of their criticism. Didn't learn that at seminary either. Or business school, right? What's the model that's, that we're operating out of? I'm, I'm like anti-whiteness, but, but can I accident, and let me say, let me say this or anti-whiteness, meaning white supremacy, right? Meaning white um, fashion, you know what I mean, right? I don't, she said she was anti-white people. No, nope. I'm anti-whiteness, which is code for white supremacy, 
white supremacist ideologies, white replacement fear, white anger, white rage, all of that. It's just shorter to say whiteness. So I do when I write and talk. I've been with a lot of women, black women, who have internalized the gaze of whiteness so much that they can give it back out. By the way, they talk. I don't want to be that girl. So I'm asking my team to interrogate my leadership so I can live the womanist, flat hierarchy, your voice mattersness of my dreams, which goes away when I'm stressed out and need to move quickly. You know? That's not, that's not flourishy. <laughs> you can undo all of the team building you're trying to make because you had a bad day and you didn't sleep. I can give them permission to help me be me. And that's the covenant we made yesterday. Help me be the best me. You coach me, I coach you back. You have the power to give your grandchild permission to be themselves. You have the power to build relationship with someone that you don't think you have anything in common with. You have the power to examine your theological perspective if it hurts somebody else. You have the power. You have the power to reset your compass toward what you want to be because you're still alive on the planet. And you can do whatever you want until you're not. You have the power to do this hard work. It starts with you. Your imagination, your creativity, the space between the now and the not yet, what you see as possible. You have the power to love the hell out of the world. But part of your work is to love you well. So you can show other people how to do it, one young poet says. You gotta love you well. What do you mean by that, Missy? Every day, cada dia, when I was learning Spanish, we had a Spanish teacher, cada dia, every day, I wake up, I wash my face, I wash my hands, I make my bed, a whole list of things. Every day, every day, you who are your best thing can look in the mirror and whatever is your theological or ethical underscoring, whatever it is that makes you think about you, I would be saying, I think you're a child of God. I would be saying, I think you have a divine spark. I would be saying there's something about the holy in the world that is inside you. That's the language I would use. But what's the language you use to tell yourself, please forgive me, United Methodist, nice church room, that you're a badass? What's the language you need? to tell yourself that. What's the language you need to sell yourself, gentlemen, who are more pulled in than I am? What's the language that you need to tell yourself in the mirror every day? This right here is a tool I've been given that is full of light and love and power and goodness, and I'm gonna take care of it today. I'm gonna notice it today. I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell it, I'm going to greet it today, not with disdain and disgust, but with welcome and cherish. And I'm going to say today, today, if I make a mistake today, let it teach me something I need to know. If I hurt somebody's feelings today, forgive me and help me to not do it again tomorrow. Today, let me eat well. Today, let me drink enough water. Today, let me rest well. Today, let me not medicate myself with work. My issue. Feeling so peppy and working so hard so I don't have to feel feelings. Feel me? That's what I do. Anybody else like that? <laughs> Today, I'm going to just brush, brush my teeth or, you know, rinse my temporaries, whatever it is in there. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to floss my teeth. I'm going to wash my face. And when I look in the mirror, I'm going to see reflected back a gift to the universe. Me. Yeah, a gift to the universe. Why? Because there's no one else like you, not even your twin. 
No one else is exactly like you. No one else is important as you. No one is standing where you're standing, seeing what you're seeing, knowing what you're knowing. Nobody else has had your experiences. Nobody else is the sum total of all that is wonderful that has happened to you, nor the sum total of what's tragic and heartbreaking and just frankly crappy. All of that stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly makes you you, gives you empathy, gives you courage, gives you the ability to resist because you've resisted. You have a resistance muscle, gives you the ability for compassion. That's it, you're it, you're the one, you're the only one, and you're the one we're waiting for. Just you, only you, only you, on that corner at that moment, in that classroom at that moment doing the thing, seeing the thing, responding to the thing as only you can. To move the needle toward love, to set somebody's heart straight, to push in the tough spots and tell the hard truth, actually, no, that doesn't work well. And you didn't say it, and then it didn't happen. You got to stand up for the colleague. You got to stand up for the vulnerable. You've got to be you in every moment, bringing your best to you, to the healing of the world. You just have to do it. Or we don't get to complain. I'm not ready. I'm, again, I will be 64. I'm not ready for the trajectory of this nation. Are you? I can't stay here. I can't take, I can't do it. If we don't do better, I'm gonna go to Paris. <laughs> Take a little middle church people with me, start a new church in Paris. You'll see me at the, at the cafe, eating a croissant. I'll be on the Zoom. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Middle Church Paris. Um, we just, it just, we're just not, it's just not okay. And we can be depressed and down and sort of uh, resigned, or we can be frisky and feisty and uh, consider ourselves formidable opponents to the, ideolo to the ideologies of hatred. We are. We are at war. This ideology, hate the people unless they are in a certain box or an ideology of love. An ideology of throwing away people, canceling people, an ideology of grace an ideology of locking up folks, or an ideology of restitution, second chances. An ideology of bootstraps, you're only poor because you didn't work hard enough. Or an ideology of wonder if there's enough resources for everybody. Socialism. Rabbi Jesus was a socialist, so I'm good with it. So what are we gonna do? Okay? I have no idea what time it is, but I'll bet I'm done. <laughs> yeah. um, friends, tomorrow we're going to spend some time talking about Ubuntu, which is this idea of I am who I am because you are who you are. And some of you won't be here for that because you'll be in school or class or at work. But uh, I want to encourage you to read Fierce Love and read about Ubuntu or just Google it. But that's what I'm talking about when I say um, I need you to survive and you need me back. Um, we need each other to make it through. That's what it is. We're going to talk more about it, put some examples on it. It's uh, rumored that Michael Ray is going to sing. He's got a beautiful voice. Um, but I hope you'll come if you can. And I hope that you'll take away these, this, these few words in summary. You are unique fingerprints, handprints, footprints, heartbeat. You're the only you in the world. And I think that makes you precious. And I think it makes you essential. Because you are going to be at the right place at the right time to do the right thing, to heal somebody. So the, so the ripples of healing just flow. Oh my god, can you feel that? Like, you just were right there on that corner, and that lady in the hijab, and those people were scowling, and you were kind, and 
everybody went, that's yes, right? You were right there in that corner and the little boy's pants were, what the heck is with the drop pants? I don't understand it, but their pants were dropped and the hats were back and the dock markers were on and people were crossing the street away from the boy and you were like, I'm not afraid of this boy. And you said, good morning. And he said, good morning, ma'am. Ripples of healing, right? You did not send the tweet that came from your Uncle Bob. It's always Uncle Bob saying some crazy stuff. You just didn't send it and you made ripples of healing. You blocked it, you stopped it. You stopped Uncle Bob. I will not allow his hatred to flow through the ether. You looked upon the face of a child who just needed to see that someone saw them and you did it. That's your job and it starts with you. Thank you. multi-ethnic choir singing glory. Chinese people singing gospel music, black folks, and all manners of white folks, and all of us singing glory together. It starts with a little tea Christmas piece, and I hope you enjoy it.
glory comes. One day when all the ills are over, it's because we did our work. And it starts with us. Thanks.